Greetings, YouTubers, and welcome to the long overdue episode 5 of my series, Lies That Flurfs Tell. It's obviously been some time since I last produced content, but I shan't bore you with why that is. Instead, let's move straight into today's flurf lie, there's no evidence that Earth rotates. This particular lie is so egregious that I will dedicate a few episodes to it, but I'm going to start with the simplest possible explanation, which is geostrophic flow. You may more commonly recognize this as wind. Here we see a standard weather map for the continental United States at 7am on the 8th of March 2024. Isobars, that is, lines of equal pressure, are shown as solid brown lines. The altitude of the 500 millibar level is shown as dashed red lines. And the wind directions are shown using wind barbs. Wind barbs consist of a line that is parallel to the flow of the wind and a fletching in the direction that the wind comes from, showing the strength of the wind. Wind barbs have their own coating system, but I'm not going to go into the details of it. For this discussion, it's only important which direction the wind is moving in. In this figure, I've highlighted the 558 millibar contour and the wind barbs closest to it. We see instantly that the wind tends to flow parallel to the isobar rather than across it. There are some minor deviations because of topography and boundary layer effects, but in general this pattern holds true. The other feature worth noting is that when viewed from the high pressure side of the isobar, which is to the south over the Caribbean, the wind flows to the right. This pattern is observed to hold true for all weather systems in the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, the winds flow to the left when viewed from the high pressure side of the isobar. Given a high pressure system and a low pressure system that are next to one another, one would expect that by default, the air would flow directly from the high pressure to the low pressure system, traveling perpendicular to the isobars, not parallel to them. And indeed, this is what happens initially. An air packet at the high pressure system will progress towards the low pressure system across the steepest path of descent in the isobars. But as a packet of material moves, it is always deflected orthogonal to its velocity, rightward in the northern hemisphere, leftward in the southern hemisphere. As the air packet is deflected away from the path of steepest descent in pressure gradient, the pressure gradient decreases and the force due to air pressure on the air packet is reduced. This cycle repeats as the air packet moves. It is deflected in the same sense, to the right in the northern hemisphere, to the left in the southern hemisphere, and the air pressure gradient reduces. This process continues until eventually the air packet's motion is entirely parallel to the isobar. This occurs when the normal force due to the pressure gradient is equal to the deflection in the opposite sense. At this point, the forces perpendicular to the isobar cancel one another out, and only the motion parallel to the isobar remains. It is this persistent rightward deflection that results in tropical storms in the northern hemisphere rotating counterclockwise, while the persistent left-hand deflection in the southern hemisphere makes tropical storms rotate clockwise. Famously, these effects are clearly illustrated in high-altitude photographs of tropical storm systems. But as we've already seen, the same trends are immediately obvious in everyday weather patterns. Air packets in motion are deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere until their primary direction of flow is parallel to the isobars, not perpendicular to them. This process is further illustrated in this map of tropical storm paths. While the influence of ocean surface temperature is non-negligible, we can see that in general, storms track to the right in the northern hemisphere as they leave the equator and to the left in the southern hemisphere. We can further see that there is a tendency for the deflection to grow stronger as the storms move further away from the equator. The same pattern of rightward deflection in the northern hemisphere and leftward deflection in the southern hemisphere is observed in ocean gyres. Southern hemisphere ocean gyres rotate anticlockwise, deflecting to the left. Northern hemisphere ocean gyres rotate clockwise, deflecting to the right. Detailed investigations of ocean currents show us that western currents are generally stronger than eastern currents. For instance, the Gulf Stream that runs along the westward side of the Atlantic, the east coast of the United States, is vastly stronger, faster and deeper than the Canary Current, which runs along the eastern edge of the Atlantic Ocean. 
Similarly, the Curacao current in the Western Pacific is vastly stronger than the California current in the Eastern Pacific. Similarly, the Agulhas current of the Western Indian Ocean is vastly stronger than the Western Australian current of the Eastern Indian Ocean. Western boundary current intensification shows us that deflection effects are very strong near the poles. By the time the gyre reaches the eastern boundary of the ocean basin, most of the water that needs to be deflected has already been deflected, resulting in very weak eastern currents. However, as the gyre returns to the equator, deflection effects become extremely small, so that there is not much poleward deflection of the gyre. As a result, when the gyre meets the western boundary of the ocean basin, there is still a lot of water that must be deflected poleward. This results in very strong western currents. So to review, our observational evidence suggests that there is a deflection effect that acts orthogonal to material velocity, deflects to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere when viewed from the high pressure cell or relative to the motion of the material packet. This orthogonal deflection shows no sensitivity to the direction of velocity, but acts uniformly to deflect winds and ocean currents to flow parallel to isobars rather than orthogonal to them. All of which begs the question, is there a physical process that can explain all of these observations? I'm so glad you asked. The answer is yes. A body moving with tangential velocity across the surface of a sphere that is rotating is subject to a fictitious or emergent force due to the Coriolis effect. This Coriolis force is proportional to the cross product between the angular velocity vector and the velocity vector of the object. This form for the Coriolis force dictates that the resulting deflection is always orthogonal to the object's velocity. The angular velocity vector points towards the North Pole and has magnitude equal to the angular velocity with which the sphere is rotating. If we know the object's tangential velocity, we can calculate the resulting cross product very easily, giving the acceleration due to Coriolis that the body experiences. This resulting acceleration may contain a vertical component that acts either upwards or downwards. We're not really interested in this component at the moment, so we'll remove it using some simple vector algebra. This gives us an explicit form for the tangential acceleration due to Coriolis experienced by the body. As inelegant as the terms in this vector look, when we calculate its magnitude, we can simplify quite considerably. I've shown the details here just to reassure any flat earthers who may happen on this presentation that mathematics is not actually magic, and that we can simplify this in a series of logical steps that rely on some very simple substitutions that I have color-coded for their benefit. Anyway, after all of those manipulations, we end up with a very simple form for the magnitude of the tangential acceleration due to Coriolis. We see instantly that this acceleration is very small near the equator and becomes larger as one approaches the poles. We also see that the magnitude of the deflection effect scales linearly with the velocity of the object, but is independent of the direction of that velocity. In the Southern Hemisphere, latitudes are negative, so the sign of latitude is always negative, which explains why Coriolis accelerations act in the opposite sense in the Southern Hemisphere. Thus, without any manipulation or forcing or introduction of new variables, Coriolis explains each and every observable facet of the deflection effect that influences objects on Earth. In stark contrast to the elegant simplicity with which Coriolis explains our observational data, flat earthers have no explanation for any of them. They can't explain why winds flow parallel to isobars rather than perpendicular to them. They can't explain why winds deflect to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern. They can't explain why deflection effects intensify near the poles while being extremely weak near the equator, nor do they have any explanation for the intensification of western boundary currents in ocean gyres. Instead, they fall back on that old flat earth standby of making shit up. They invent multiple completely unsubstantiated phenomena to try and explain away these observations, none of which has any observational support. Anyway, that's where I might leave things for today. Thank you so much for watching, I really do appreciate it. And I am very sorry that I haven't been producing more content, but I hope to remedy that in the near future. So I hope you'll join me then when I'll be discussing gyroscopic evidence for the rotation of Earth.